What if I told you there is a crop that you plant once and it comes back forever? A crop that survives heat, frost, drought, floods, and still produces more food per acre than potatoes, more calories than corn, and more resilience than almost anything we grow today. A crop that never needed irrigation, never needed fertilizer, never needed a seed catalog or a tractor or a chemical company behind it. A crop so powerful that it fed entire nations during famine, war, and collapse. Yet today, most people have never even heard its name. Not because it was weak, but because it was too strong. The world does not forget crops like this by accident. It buries them. This is the story of the sunchoke, a plant humanity depended on for centuries, then quietly pushed out of sight. A perennial food source that threatens the logic of modern agriculture, that farmers must plant every year, buy every year, and depend every year. But long before agriculture became an industry, this plant grew at the edges of forests and prairies, rising each spring from the same undying root. A root that promised something revolutionary, food without permission. If you walk through old homesteads in the American Midwest, through abandoned indigenous gardens, through forgotten colonial forts, you will still find it, growing tall, bright, and unbothered. A living memory of a world where abundance did not require approval and survival did not require a storehouse of seed. The story begins long before the arrival of wheat, long before the rise of industrial fields. Native tribes across North America knew this root intimately. Some called it sunroot, others earth apple, others white Jerusalem. But everyone agreed on one thing. It was a plant of generosity. It grew anywhere, in rocky soil, in clay soil, at forest margins, along riverbanks, in burned prairies and abandoned clearings. It came back after fires. It returned after floods. It regenerated after frost. It multiplied under the snow and broke new ground every spring, spreading its tubers like hidden treasure beneath the earth. You didn't have to plant it every year. The land did that for you. For thousands of years, indigenous communities harvested sunchokes at the turn of each season. In lean years, they relied on them entirely. In times of plenty, they dried or roasted the roots, storing them in baskets lined with cattail fibers. Warriors and travelers carried them as endurance food. Children dug them with wooden sticks. Elders spoke of them as a plant you could build a life around. The sun choke was not a last resort. It was the opposite, a dependable companion. When Europeans arrived, they recorded something remarkable. During harsh winters, indigenous villages that cultivated sunchokes survived far better than those relying only on hunting or on grain. Colonists soon depended on the root themselves. There are records from French forts, English trading posts, and Spanish missions, all describing the same phenomenon. When crops failed, when supply ships did not arrive, when diseases thinned their fields, the sunchoke kept them alive. It was a plant that refused to abandon people. Yet somehow, a plant this reliable, this nutritious, this abundant, never became a global staple. Instead, it faded away, and the reasons reveal far more about our systems than about the plant itself. The first strike came from its shape. Sunchokes do not grow in neat, perfect globes. Their tubers twist, fork, curl, and knot. They are irregular, unpredictable, and unique. In an era before industrial sorting machines, that didn't matter. But when agriculture shifted toward efficiency and uniformity, crops were judged not by their nutrition or resilience, but by their obedience. Potatoes lined up in neat rows, corn grew in perfect grids, but sunchokes defied the field. You cannot run a mechanical harvester through a sunchoke patch without chaos. Machines don't like uneven ground. Machines don't like deep roots. Machines don't like unpredictability. 
and sunchokes are pure unpredictability in the best possible sense. They grow where they choose. They return even if you dig them out. They spread when they're ready. They reappear years after being forgotten. They belong to the land, not the plow. Modern agriculture had no place for such independence. The second strike came from storage. Unlike potatoes, which store dry and firm, sunchokes have a tendency to soften over time as their natural inulin, a complex carbohydrate, breaks down into sugars. This makes them sweet, mild, and incredibly digestible. But it also means they do not behave like standardized commodities. You cannot centralize a food that refuses to sit quietly in a warehouse. The third strike was economic. You plant sunchokes once, and the patch produces food for a decade or more. No annual seed purchases, no fertilizers, no pesticides, no soil amendments, no irrigation, no tilling. A farmer who relies on sunchokes becomes independent, and independence is the one thing modern agricultural industries cannot monetize. But the most dangerous strike is the one no company would ever admit. The sun choke grows too well. It produces four to six times more biomass per acre than potatoes. It thrives in drought, flourishes in poor soil, and shrugs off pests. It grows in climates where corn dies and wheat fails. It regenerates itself without human intervention. A crop that gives so much with so little threatens the entire structure of agricultural commerce, a structure built on annual consumption, cyclical scarcity, and predictable dependence. So the sun choke was rebranded, not as food, not as medicine, but as a weed. Farm bulletins in the early 1900s described it as invasive, troublesome, unfit for commercial farming. Newspapers warned farmers never to let it near their fields because it returns forever. Officials recommended burning patches that grew near farmlands. Imagine that. A plant that can end hunger labeled a nuisance. A plant that grows where nothing else survives called an intruder. A plant that could stabilize food systems dismissed because it asks for nothing. Yet the sun choke never listened. It continued to appear in abandoned fields, in gardens where someone once planted a single root, in ditches, in forest clearings, in places where memory lingers in the soil. And every time it returned, it carried the same quiet resilience it always had. The resilience of a crop that remembers a world before ownership. But that is not the end of its story. Today, as climate change reshapes the planet, the world is circling back to the very plant it cast aside. In the last decade, researchers studying climate-resilient crops have repeatedly stumbled upon the same name, Helianthus tuberosus, the sunchoke. In experimental plots, it withstands heat that kills corn. It grows roots through soil too poor for wheat. It survives frost better than potatoes. It rebounds after drought without irrigation. It pulls nutrients from deep layers, restoring depleted land instead of draining it. Beneath the soil, the roots store something extraordinary. Inulin, a natural prebiotic fiber that feeds the beneficial bacteria of the gut, stabilizes blood sugar, nourishes the immune system, and improves nutrient absorption. Modern nutrition science now claims these benefits as new discoveries. Indigenous healers knew the sunchoke strengthened digestion centuries ago. In France, it helped villages survive the famine of 1709. In Canada, it sustained the settlers through brutal winters. During World War II, Europeans dug the roots from frozen ground when rations failed. It is a famine food, a war food, a drought food, a survival food, but also perhaps most importantly, a freedom food because when a plant grows forever, no one can own it. When a crop requires no seed, no fertilizer, and no chemicals, no one can control it. When food rises from the same root year after year, humans become harder to starve, harder to govern through scarcity, harder to push into dependency. The world never rejected sunchokes because they tasted bad. They taste like sweet potatoes kissed with artichoke. 
It never rejected them because they were unhealthy. They are among the most nutrient-dense tubers on Earth. It never rejected them because they were weak. They are nearly indestructible. The world rejected them because they gave too much. But the plant never disappeared. It stayed low in the soil, waiting, multiplying, spreading quietly across the landscapes that forgot it. Every spring it rises again, gold flowers turning toward the sun, roots pushing new life into the earth. A reminder that the land still offers abundance, even when society tries to engineer scarcity. If you walk along an old fence line or the edge of a forgotten pasture, you may see it, tall, bright, confident, as if it never left. Because in truth, it did not. We just stopped looking. The sunchoke does not need praise or approval or certification. It does not need a marketplace. It does not need an industry to validate it. It simply grows and grows and grows. Plant once, harvest forever. And maybe that is exactly why you were never supposed to know about it. The knowledge was not lost, only ignored. Waiting underground, in every tuber, for the world to need it again.